we will start in another four minutes. Um, I think we can begin. Sagar, what do you say? Yeah, we can. We can start, I think. Okay. Cool. So there's 27 people. So I think yeah, it's probably a good time to start. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, you are. All right. Perfect. Um, so good evening, everyone, again. And uh, welcome back to the lecture series that I've been giving. Uh, I'm Vikrant here. And today we're going to be talking about Lagrangians and a little bit of gauge theories again. Uh, we've discussed gauge theories in the previous session, which was done yesterday. Um, so uh, Lagrangians is something that all of you have heard of. Uh, you, you've heard about, uh, you know, the Euler-Lagrange equations probably, or uh, every theory that you read, um, you, you've always come across this word called the Lagrangian. So today, I will try to tell you about the origin of, of Lagrangian, you know, from where, where was it actually uh, derived from the mathematics behind it a little bit and uh, then we will uh, look at a few examples uh, one of which or two examples probably something that you're familiar with uh, and we will look at one purely mathematical example so one mathematical example and two physics examples of Lagrangians and then we'll try to understand why are they studied extensive so let's begin so the first thing we're going to cover are Lagrangians and I'm going to shift to white. I'm going to be live writing today. Um, there's no presentation for today. All right. uh, the questions, if you have any, please do put them in the chat box and I will address them at the end of the talk. Thank you. All right. So uh, to, in order to understand Lagrangians, we have to go all the way back to our regular calculus, uh, our integral and differential calculus, integration and differentiation. Uh, and there's a field of study there called the calculus of variations. I think I will write this a little better. Calculus of variations. Now, what I won't be getting into the depth of what exactly is calculation of variation is all about, but I can tell you this much, right? So, in our ordinary calculus, what we deal with are functions of a single variable. So when we say y, uh, y depends on x. So we call that a function of x. We call y to be a function of x. This is called a function, right? Now, uh, the, the whole field of calculus of variations deals with something more generalized. Now, what that deals with is if we have a function f, that is a function of y, y dot, and x. All right, where y dot is the derivative of y with respect to x. And this implies that my y is a function of x. So what's happening here is this is a function of a function. My f is a function of y, which in itself is a function of x. So f is a function of y, for example, which again is a function of x. So it's a function that depends on another function. And, you know, we also include the derivatives and so on. That's again, the whole field of calculus of variations. But in calculus of variations, we deal with this. Now, the other part of this is now, now let's assume a regular coordinate space, right? We have 
y here and we have x here and i'll take any two random points x1 y1 the coordinates of that point and we have x2 and y2 the coordinates of the second point the question we ask ourselves here is what is the shortest distance between these right that's the question that uh, calculus of variations tries to address uh, in in the, in the bigger picture now uh, if you're already familiar with all of this you would directly say that it's a straight line you know uh, and i'm going to mark that with a red line like so right um so that's something we already know that's something we've been taught in school that a straight line is the shortest distance between any two given points on a plane right but is that the only path available is there no other way we can get to let's say point uh, from point a to point b is the red line the only path the answer is no all right there are there are infinitely many ways you can get from a to b and i i will draw some arbitrarily random ways you can go all the way like this you can go like this and come like this you know it's just the direction of travel it's really whatever it is right i can even go out of the board and then come back all the way from here and and still come like this and go to b you know anything is possible i'm i'm, I'm going to get rid of this but what i'm trying to say here is that there are infinitely many paths possible so how would you decide which is the shortest path and that's what calculus of variation tries to answer so i'm just going to draw a few arbitrary paths here randomly all right these are these are ones that take a longer distance uh, and i will draw a few shorter paths which are very close to the original one that we know all right like so you know these are just very very close to the red ones that that's what we can uh, you know that's what we are trying to address here all right so uh, what we have you know all of these can be defined by a functional because all of these paths the blue path has a slope and it's a, again a function of x but it also has a slope at every point and it again depends on x so for each of these paths we can define a functional as f that depends on y which again depends on x internally it depends on y dot the slope of the path and it depends on x all right we are trying to now study a quantity we'll call j which is the integral of this functional y y dot and x as we go from x1 to x2 or in in more general terms from e to b dx this uh, it as far as i know it doesn't have a very specific name but we'll just call it some invariant quantity all right we'll just call it j the invariant quantity or just j okay this is what calculus of function uh, calculus of variations tries to answer it tries to solve this integral now uh, i won't be getting going through the entire mathematical derivation but what we are looking at is we want a requirement we want j to be extremized and what we mean by that we want delta j the change in j to be equal to 0 we want it to be the uh, maximum most or the minimum most possible value we don't want it to be a little extra we don't want it to be a little less we don't want a little more we don't want a little less we want exactly the maximum or the or exactly the minimum okay so when you put both both of those together uh, you say it is extremized and this is not something new to us right if you have studied differential calculus uh, each time you try to find the extremum of a point you remember that you you put dy by dx equal to 0 and then you get a point and then you put that back and you know you call that the minimum or the maximum of the function and so on this is just a generalization of all of that right uh, we are dealing with functionals instead of function all right so that's what we're trying to do and uh, you will realize that if if i'm changing my j what i'm actually doing is i'm changing my entire integral from x1 to x2 which is a function of y y dot and x dx all right now there's a huge mathematical process uh, in order to solve this entire thing but the end result is what i will give you here the end result is the euler lagrange equations okay for now i will just call them the euler lagrange equations and what are these equations let's look at those So f by d y minus d by d x, the f by d y dot equal to zero. 
Now, some of you may not understand what the fancy Ds are for. They're just partial derivatives. It's when you differentiate a function of one variable and keep every other variable as a constant. All right. Uh, so a quick intro to partial derivatives. If I have a function of y comma x, uh, then dou f by dou x, I differentiate only with ref x, I differentiate only x, and y is treated as a constant. Okay. And if I say dou f by dou y, I differentiate only y and x is treated as a constant. Okay, that's what a partial derivative is all about. And when you solve this, this uh, relation here, when you solve this with the derivative uh, and integration by parts and so on and so forth, what you get is this equation. So, and, and what does, what is the result of this equation? This is a differential equation, but this is a partial differential equation okay and the solution of this the solution of this partial differential equation which i write as pde gives us the required extremized path all right so in other terms um, if i was to consider this problem right here what that equation would give me is the equation for this red line which uh, you might directly guess would, would be the equation of a straight line, right? And, and let's try to do that. Let's try to do that very explicitly. And this is the first mathematical example that I told I'll give you about, uh, about uh, uh, the Euler Lagrange equations. And we'll get to the Lagrangian after this, all right? So uh, our aim is to find, sorry, to find the shortest distance between two points on a plane, right? We know the answer is uh, the straight line. So I will just write that in blue, right? And we will try to arrive at that. Straight line is the answer, okay? All right. Now, since we're talking about a plane and two points, let's just try to visualize. We have two points here, x1, one, and so on, right? We have the x-axis here. We have the y-axis here. And we can drop perpendiculars to see what distances they have, and you know we get a triangle. We have we have a, a right angle triangle right here. This is x one, this is x two, uh, this is y two, and this is y one. Right? This is y two. All right. Uh, we have these points now. Uh, the, uh, the 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 distance that we're trying to calculate turns out to be the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle. So I will call that d s. I will call this dx and I will call this dy, where dx is x2 minus x1 and dy is y2 minus y1. So from Pythagoras theorem, we can simply say that ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared. Fairly simple. It is just a simple Pythagoras theorem to find the distance between these two points. Um, this is also called the arc element or the line element. All right. And the total. Okay, so, so uh, I can also write this as, if I take the dx common, I can write this as dy by dx, the whole squared, under square. This, this is my arc element. So I should probably put this as the arc element without the square. All right. Now, like we had the variable j here that we were trying to extremize, we will have a similar quantity, which will give us the total distance. Uh, we'll, we'll just call it, let's say j again. This time it will be the integral of ds from x1 to x2. All right. And if I put the value of dx there, x1, x2, 1 plus dy by dx, the whole squared under square root dx. Now uh, I can simplify this notation. If I just put y dot equals dy by dx, it's just a notation that we choose. Then my j becomes integral x1 to x2, 1 plus y dot squared dx. Let's carry this over to the next page. What we have is basically j, which is an integral from x1 to x2, 1 plus y dot squared under square root dx. Now, if we compare this with our uh, quantity that we defined, we just had f y y dot x dx. If we compare both of these, what we realize is this f, the functional that we had, is the, quant is the integrand, the 
thing that we're integrating. It's just that it has no Y dependence and it has no explicit X dependence. The X doesn't come out there directly. All right. Now using this, you can, uh, you, you, uh, so what we realized, you know, from the whole long derivation that I've skipped um, is if I want to find the path, I just need to solve this equation because I was able to get it in this functional form in, in this form. Since I was able to get it in this form, it's just a simple problem of calculation, uh, calculus of variations. And uh, if I want to find what my path is, I just need to solve this equation. Uh, do f by do y minus d by dx do f by do y dot equals zero. Now I won't solve the entire differential equation for you. It's a little long in, in, in some sense, but I'll tell you what, uh, what the end result is, right? Uh, when you solve all of this, uh, the, the result that we need we needed something like this, y as a function of x. Well, let me, I should probably use a different letter. What we basically need is y as a function of x, because you know, in, in the end, our path that we need depends only on x, right? We have a y of x here, and we just have x here. So our final result that we need just has to be a y of x, because that's, that's how you represent any equation of a line, right? And uh, when you do that, when you when you solve the Euler Lagrange equation, which is this, when you solve this, when you find those terms, I'll just give you how to differentiate these because some of you might be new to partial derivatives. Since there is no explicit y term here, this is just equal to zero. And uh, y dot here is treated as a variable in itself. So the derivative of that would be y dot over one plus y dot squared under root. Okay, so basically my this equation would be d by dx y dot one plus y dot squared equal to zero. And you know, this is again a differential equation. You have to differentiate all of these and so on. The end result that you get y will be y equals mx plus c, which is exactly what we needed, right? We already knew the answer that the, uh, the distance between them, the shortest, um, distance between them is going to be a straight line. And that's exactly what we get when you solve this differential equation. And, and this is how calculus of variation helps us minimize everything or extremize everything that we need, right? So it gives us a quantity that remains uh, invariant in a sense. So when, when, you, when we talk about distances in physics, we say that the distance or the length of any object remains invariant in its own frame of reference. That's a little too complicated to comprehend, but that's okay. Right. That's, that's the whole idea of this, you know, the application of this is found in uh, concepts of physics like those. All right. So there we have it. So uh, let's, let's sort of recap what we've done so far. Calculus of variations. That's the field that we are studying. All right. Um, we have a quantity, a J quantity, which is defined as the integral from X1 to X2 of a functional y, y dot, and x dx, where y dot is dy by dx. And it's just a regular derivative, right? Uh, this particular quantity is called the functional. Okay, it's a function of a function. Uh, to find the solution for solutions, we have the Euler-Lagrange equations which are defined as dou f by dou y minus d by dx dou f by dou y dot equal to zero. And this is what we've learned so far. All right. And uh, to so when we solve this equation, we get uh, after solving PDE, which is the above partial differential equation, we get y as a function of x. I'll just write g in order to differentiate it from the f that we've already used. They're different things. Okay, that's what we've learned so far. In physics, now when you when you make this transition to physics, right, you define a quantity. So I will write this in physics. Okay, uh, we define a quantity a as the integral from T1 to T2 L that depends on Q, Q1, 
Q dot, T, and DT. Now, a lot of new terminology here. So let's uh, carefully look at what everything is happening. What's happening here? All right. This A here is called the action. Okay, and this is similar to the J that we had. We had a J here instead of a J. We have A. All right. Then instead of F, so so uh, whatever we had the integrand to be, this is the functional. Okay, let's look at the parts of the functional a little later, but you know that's the functional that we have. Uh, and instead of x here, we had dx. Right? Instead of dx, we have dt, which means we're changing the variable from x to t. Okay, and uh, what exactly is q dot? It's dq over dt. All right. Now, now let's look at the function. We have l, q, q dot, and t. This is what we have. Okay, this itself is called the Lagrangian of the system. All right. This is how. Uh, I mean, this is what a Lagrangian is a function of. Okay, we still haven't got gotten to how how does a Lagrangian look, but this is what Lagrangian depends on. It depends on q, q dot, and t. So now let's look at what q is. Q is called the generalized coordinate. Now you're already familiar with coordinates. You're familiar with x, y, or x, y, z, and so on, right? But you know when you have more and more dimensions coming in, you run out of alphabets. So you sort of represent it as Q, you know, whichever it is, you just represent it as Q. Uh, in some textbooks, you might also find a I here, you know, a subscript I. That just means that you're that you're being that you're summing over uh, all of those uh, indices. Okay, so it doesn't really make a difference, but it's a generalized coordinate. Um, the next quantity that we have is Q dot, right, which is defined as dQ over dt. Now let's take a quick detour that if q was equal to x, for example, then q dot would be dx over dt. And we know this to be the velocity, right? Or if it if q was, let's say, um, theta, the angle, angle variable, then q dot would be d theta by dt, which is the angular, still a velocity. Right? It's just a different type of velocity, but it's still a velocity. So by the same logic, Q dot is called the generalized velocity. The change of the generalized coordinate with respect to time. So a generalized velocity and you know, by default, T is just time. All right. Uh, so yeah, I won't be getting into the depth of how, how do you uh, interpret this Lagrangian in terms of a graph like I drew here, like this. But in a sense, what you have going on is, uh, is how your system is evolving with respect to time. Okay, how, how you're, what Lagrangian tells you is the evolution of your system with respect to time, if it evolves or not evolves, or how, how does it evolve? How does it depend on the velocities and the positions and so on and so forth? All right. I, I would rather leave that up to you as an assignment to interpret what uh, this quantity is. But what I'll tell you next is how do you write a Lagrangian for a specific system? Okay. But before we get to that, we need to have an analog of this Euler-Lagrange equations for our Lagrangian here. So we're going to do that. The Euler Lagrange equations become dou L by dou Q this time because you know we're, we've replaced our Y with Q minus D by DT. We replace our X with T dou L by dou Q dot equal to zero because we replaced our Y dot with Q dot. Right? So these are the Euler Lagrange equations for a Lagrangian L. And just for a reminder, our L is a functional that depends on the generalized coordinate Q, the generalized velocity Q dot, and time T, an explicit dependence on time T. All right, so that's the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now, when you solve this back here, we got a path 
that was y of the form y equals g of x right so we get some path um in term in in the physics terms we get we get on solving this pde the equation of motion now you're already familiar with a lot of equations of motion like like f equals ma or uh, or a dot a double dot which or, or acceleration equals minus g for free fall you know you're already familiar with equations of motion like that those are called equations of motion and you're already familiar with those so solving this equation actually gives us the equation of motion but you know uh, sometimes we just tend to call these the euler lagrange equations of motion we just put that equation of motion right here we, we you know sometimes avoid solving uh, the partial differential equation uh, but you know that's just uh, terminology you you're free to do however you like now um, i'll go ahead and i will give you two examples that you're familiar with you would have heard of uh, the first one being how do you get momentum momentum also turns out to be a equation of motion in a sense right because uh, from newton's second law f equals dp over dt and if there's no external force acting on it right if no external force acts on it then my dp over dt is just equal to zero or p is a constant right we know this from newton's second law right this is what we'll try to derive from the whole lagrangian concept so now we come to how do you write a lagrangian any lagrangian can be written in the form of l you know that's the lagrangian that we have which depends on q q dot and t equal to p minus v now what are these okay i i will first write down this now t of q dot is the kinetic energy and it depends as you can see only on q dot so it depends only on velocity now the example of this you are already familiar with t equals half mv squared you know the kinetic energy of a moving body now in 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 the in terms of generalized coordinates you would write this as t of q dot equals half m q dot squared all right now v of q is the potential energy and it depends only on position right it depends only on the position and you're already familiar with several of these uh, but you know there are different forms of potential so i won't be getting into the details of that but uh, some of them you are already familiar with we have v equals mgh the gravitational uh, thing that you study or uh, for a harmonic oscillator it is of the form half m omega squared x squared i believe half k x squared so yeah it's it's of that so it depends only on x you see it depends only on x here it only depends on h m and g are constants here and m and omega are constants so it only depends on x or h or in general it just depends on the position which is q okay so that's how you define a lagrangian now let's look at an example okay a free moving particle freely moving particle okay so we we let the potential which depends on q equal to 0 okay it's moving with some velocity v with velocity v okay the lagrangian then uh, which is defined as l is t minus v but v is 0 and t for any moving particle with mass m is just half mv squared right but since we are doing this in generalized coordinate i will replace this v squared with q dot squared all right now i need to find the equation of motion the aim is to find 
the equation of motion, a shorthand notation for equation of motion is just EOM, equation of motion, right? And to find the equation of motion, I need to solve, need to solve the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, which for our case is this. Right. I will explicitly calculate all of these terms in this example uh, because it's fairly simple and it won't take much time. All right. So, um, <clears throat> do L by do Q. Since I see that my Lagrangian has no Q term, you know, there is no dependence on Q. This is just equal to zero. All right. And my next term is do L by do Q dot. I see that there is a Q dot dependence. So, I differentiate this with respect to Q dot. And what I get is just MQ dot. All right. And I put this back into the equation. What we get, I can get it at the minus sign as well. And what we get is d by dt of mq dot equal to zero. Now you see it's very similar to what we had here, Newton's second law, dp by dt equal to zero, which implies p is a constant, right? So what we can deduce from here is that mq dot is equal to a constant in time. Right, because it's d by dt, and and this is just momentum. Q dot is the velocity, right? So, in 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 uh, two dimensions or one dimension, it's just mv. So, what we have here is an equation of motion, which we are already very well familiar with, right? So, so you don't have to go through the entire process of coming to Newton's second law and then figuring out what uh, force is acting, what's the momentum, and everything. All you had to do is just solve this one single equation uh, where most of the terms were quite simple to evaluate and there you have it, right? Now let's look at another example, but I won't be solving this in detail. Uh, you are free to go back and check it. Uh, a charged particle. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, we can, uh, I have one question. Uh, why we write Lagrange's as uh, the kinetic energy minus potential energy means any reason or any so a derivation there okay. is a derivation of that but you know uh, it's sort of long for the time constraint that we have for this lecture yeah yeah which is why i uh, i decided to skip over that uh, but you are refer you're free to refer to goldstein uh, classical mechanics by goldstein I'll, I'll put it at the end of the talk okay uh, that uh, he talks about why exactly is it t minus v and so on it it, it gets too long when we start to discuss about that so yeah Okay, uh, so briefly, can you tell about the significance of Lagrangian? Uh, we'll come to that. That's, okay. uh, we will cover that in some. Okay, Thank yeah. thanks. Right. So uh, this example that I was telling you about is a charged particle in an electromagnetic field. For this, we can write a Lagrangian. You know, we have Lagrangian equals T minus V. Uh, I won't tell you why exactly. Uh, you'll ha we'll have to go back to electrodynamics to figure out what exactly is the potential of a charged particle and that is moving and so on, right? Uh, but if it's moving, it has a kinetic energy half mv squared. And the potential terms can be written as q5 plus q a dot v, where phi is the scalar potential Right. If you if you know a little bit of electromagnetism or electrodynamics, then you would realize or uh, recognize what these are. A vector is the vector potential. All right. Uh, this comes from electrodynamics, so I won't be getting into electrodynamics here. But uh, you can prove for yourself that the Lagrangian of a charged particle moving in an electromagnetic field will have this Lagrangian. Okay. Uh, now, again, we solve the same Euler-Lagrange equations. There's no difference in that. The Euler-Lagrange equations still remain the same, which is do L by do Q. Uh, oh, I shouldn't probably write Q here. But uh, I think, it, yeah, yeah, the, the charge and all sort of gets confusing. So I think I'll probably skip writing that. But what, 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 what at the end you get after solving the Euler-Lagrange equations? After solving the Euler-Lagrange equations, what you get is this expression. This is the Lorentz force. 
And this is an equation of motion because you basically have F equals MA, which is M D squared X by D T squared. And you know, if you solve it, if you solve that twice again, you have an equation of motion. You have like X as a function of T and so on, but we, we are good to, we're good with just the force thing and we get the Lorentz force. So, you know, why, why do we do all this? You know, why do we bother ourselves with Lagrangian and why do we have to solve it and so on? The reason one is, you know, it tells you a lot about the system that you're dealing with, right? It tells you what kind of potential do you have? And it gives you a rough idea that if you were to solve the equation, what kind of path would the, uh, would the particle or the system cover, right? Now, about this charged particle in an electromagnetic field, I would not have guessed that it depends on uh, the electric field. I mean, you know, you can sort of guess how it does depend on the electric and the magnetic field, but it tells you, if you solve it in detail, it tells you the exact relationship. You know, you have the electric force, which is Q times E, and you also have a component of the magnetic force, which is Q times V cross P. Right, so solving a Lagrangian or studying the Lagrangian tells you about the system and its evolution. It, it tells you about what path is the system going to take. And uh, if, you, if you're dealing in terms of fields, then how is the field going to behave in a sense? Right, so, so that's, that's the whole point of studying a Lagrangian. Now, the reason there's another quantity called the Hamiltonian, which uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of in terms of quantum mechanics, but I won't be covering that here. But a Hamiltonian, I'll write this in red. A Hamiltonian H is defined as T plus V. That's a coincidence, okay? That's not how you find the Hamiltonian. Uh, the way of finding Hamiltonian is actually this, okay? It's Q P dot minus is Q P dot or P Q dot. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't quite remember this part, but nevertheless, it, it depends on the Lagrangian. Uh, Sagar, do you remember what that was? It was it P Q dot or Q P dot? Uh, I forgot. To P Q dot. It's P Q dot. I had it here. Okay. Never mind. Thank you. Minus L. This is how you find a Hamiltonian. Okay, it's not just T plus V. That's not how you find a Hamiltonian. But you need a Lagrangian to find the Hamiltonian. Now, coincidentally, this is also equal to the total energy of the system. And the reason you don't study Hamiltonians for your equations of motion and everything is because the total energy of a system, because of the law of conservation of energy, we know it's a constant quantity, and you can't do anything with a constant quantity. Because if I was to, let's say, I don't know, do do H by do P or something and, and, you know, find the entire set of equations and so on, it would in a sense, give me zero because it is conserved, right? It's, it's a conserved quantity and you can't really do anything with conserved quantities. On the other hand, the Lagrangian is not a conserved quantity. It's the difference between the kinetic and the potential energy. It is not conserved. It's not the same. And, and that's why every, every theory that you see, uh, they deal more with Lagrangians and the action that we had that we defined here, which was over here, right? They deal with more with action and the Lagrangian because these are the quantities that remain invariant, not a con constant, but an invariant. They don't change with change of frames of reference, this action in particular, right? But if action is invariant, then that means the Lagrangian is invariant. So it's like a correspondence there. But, you know, that's why we study Lagrangians. And... Uh, I'll, I'll give you one more example of another Lagrangian. Uh, I, I won't solve this again, of course. But uh, for the electromagnetic field, the field altogether, this, this was the Lagrangian only for a charged particle, right? But if you were to look at the entire field Lagrangian, okay, if you were to look at the entire field Lagrangian, the Lagrangian. for EM field, not a charged particle moving in an EM field, but the entire field itself. We define it as the Lagrangian of the field, you know, the field itself, but there are also interactions between them. So it's interactions there. Now, now you realize I wrote a fancy L rather than the regular L. I will get to that in a minute, 
But uh, what I would like to tell you is this fancy Lagrangian is equal to minus one by four mu naught f mu nu f mu nu minus a mu j. Now it's totally fine if you're not aware of all these terms. That's totally all right. Uh, but the ones who are familiar with electrodynamics will realize that this f mu nu, the super mu nu, is the field tensor, which tells you about the relation between the electric and the magnetic fields of the electromagnetic field. Right? It tells you about the explicit relation between each of its components. And uh, this is the vector potential that we had, but in four dimensional vector potential. Okay. And this is the current density four current density and again in four dimensions. Now this particular quantity that we have is relativistically invariant, right? So if I was to uh, put this under a Lorentz transformation, which is the whole field, you know, which is what you do in special relativity, you, you perform a Lorentz transformation and you change from one frame of reference to the other, this particular Lagrangian remains the same, right? So if, if, you know, if I was to change from one, this fancy L to another fancy L, L prime, right? Whatever equation of motion I had here is going to be the same as the equation of motion I have here, right? That's why we study uh, Lagrangians over Hamiltonians. But the equations of motion don't really change. And if you were there for my yesterday's uh, uh, lecture on gauge theories, we have, we discussed about how gauge transformations still give us uh, the same uh, equations of motion. And we showed that for the Maxwell's equation, right? Maxwell's equations are said to be gauge invariant because when you apply something called the gauge transformations, they, they still give you the same results. The resulting electric and the magnetic field are still the same. Now, this case, what we're trying, trying to discuss here is the relativistic invariance. When you apply transformations from special relativity, they, they, still, uh, you know, they still remain the same. Now let's talk about the fancy L that I've written. You know, it's, it, it looks fancy. There's a difference between this L and this L. Okay, now let's talk about that. We already saw this. This is called the Lagrangian. There's no difference there. This fancy L, which you might have seen in several papers and so on, this is called the Lagrangian density. Okay, we're talking about how much, you know, in, in a sense, we're talking about how much Lagrangian is there per unit volume or something. You know, it doesn't really make any sense when you look at it that way, but it is some sort of energy density, energy per unit volume or something like that, right? Because uh, the dimensions of Lagrangian is still the dimensions of energy. We're, do, we're just subtracting T minus V, kinetic minus potential. The dimensions, it's it's still the dimensions of energy. So in a sense, uh, you can look at it as uh, the density of energy or, or so on and so forth, right? So th there's, there exists a relation between these two, of course, since we're talking about uh, densities, you can write the capital L as the integral of the small l d cube x or or you know if you're family if you just want v because you know we're talking about volumes you can just write this to be dv right you know it's just it's just how you define your densities right uh lagrangian density or energy per unit volume multiplied with the entire volume gives you the total lagrangian so this is like the total lagrangian right and this is the Lagrangian density. Now in particle physics, uh, they use it interchangeably. Uh, in particle physics, it's almost as if L is the same as that. You know, it doesn't really make a difference much as long as you know what you're talking about. You know, it, it depends on you as to what you want to use it as, right? Now you might also see different notations for this. If you're dealing in four dimensions, then there's also the time component that comes in. So you write this as d cube x for the three space uh, variables that you have, x, y, and z, and you also have dt, right? That's only if you explicitly mention what your four dimensions are. Uh, sometimes this is also simply written as the integral of L d4x, okay? Because you have four, you're integrating over four dimensions or something like that, right? It's all just notations and so on, right? Okay, what's the time now? It's 40. Hmm. I don't think I'll be able to cover what I wanted to do for gauge theories, but uh, I have pretty much covered everything that I wanted to for the Lagrangian. Oh, let's talk about the field Lagrangian since we have only 20 minutes and I won't be able to cover gauge theory part of it. Let's talk about Lagrangians for fields in, in, in short. 
Okay. So let's take a field. Right. I'll call this the fancy five. Okay. If if you're LaTeX enthusiast, then it's the code var five. Okay. A variable five. Okay. Uh, that's how you get that uh, variable, the fancy five in, in LaTeX. Okay. So let's let's take a field like this. Okay, now this field depends, let's say, on one variable x. Okay, like you have a temperature field, uh, you have each point a temperature. We will just take a field like that. That depends on some variable x. Now, uh, our Lagrangian, I, I will use this notation now. Uh, it's implied its density. We don't have to worry about it too much. Okay. Now, this Lagrangian depends on the field itself, okay, which again depends on x. Uh, back here, we had the Lagrangian depending on, uh, let's go all the way back. We had the Lagrangian depending on the position, the derivative of the position and time, right? So similarly here, we'll have something analogous to the position, but here we have the field itself and then we need a derivative. So we take a derivative of the field itself. Okay. And we don't always mention explicit time dependence. So we'll just close it here. Okay. Our fields are uh, said to be time invariant at times, uh, but I'm not really sure about that. But in general, uh, every field Lagrangian is written in this form. We, you have this field here, right? And you have the derivative of the field. Now, what are you differentiating it with? It depends on what your field depends on. So in this case, it would have been a derivative with respect to X, but in general, it's just going to be a derivative. Derivative of Okay. Now, um, in a sense, uh, you, you can still write this as a T minus V. Okay. Uh, it's not exact. Okay. It's not the way to do it, but uh, I'm just hoping that will give you a rough idea about how, how uh, field Lagrangians um, are, are written. Okay. So in a sense, you, what we mean by the kinetic term here, so it's still kinetic minus potential because, you know, that's how we still define Lagrangians. But for a field, the definition changes a little bit. It's, it's just that uh, in the kinetic energy term has a time derivative in it. Okay. And how is that? Let's, let's just compare it with things that we already know. Uh, we know that for a moving particle, the kinetic energy is half m q dot squared, right? In other terms, what I'm writing here is half m dq by dt whole squared. This is what we mean by uh, saying, uh, uh, oh, this is what we mean when we say that there is a time derivative in the kinetic energy term. Okay. Now the exact relationship and everything depends, varies from field to field, but this works for us. Okay. This is enough for us just to say that uh, the kinetic energy term of the field Lagrangian depends on the time derivative. Um, and similarly, uh, for potential, right? We had potential that depended only on the position like MGQ or for a harmonic oscillator, if it's half KQ squared, it depends only on Q, right? So similarly here, we can say it depends on the value of psi of X of phi of X, right? So instead of position, we are looking at the field value itself. And instead of uh, velocity, we're looking at just the time derivative. That's like a very general way to put it. And, and you know, uh, you may not realize this at uh, the first time when you look at some Lagrangians, but, you know, you'll have to work a little bit on those to, to figure out where exactly um, are your time derivative or your kinetic terms and potential terms and so on. For simple, simple uh, fields like, like this one, uh, for, this is called a scalar field theory for scalar fields, like your temperature fields and so on, uh, you can generalize a Lagrangian, which is somewhat of the form. Uh, transpose of this. Oh, sorry. Minus half M, I think it's phi squared. Yeah, something like this. I, I don't exactly remember. Let me go back to one of my previous lectures. Uh, I might have mentioned it somewhere right over here. Exactly. Uh, okay. 
Let me see if I can copy paste this. Uh, I don't think I can't from document to document, but okay. Let me rewrite this. It's just the derivative of the field transposed and the derivative of the field here minus half m squared phi t phi, right? So, so in a sense, you know, this is like, this acts like the kinetic term and this acts like the potential term. So it's still a T minus V when you look at the larger picture. Now, how exactly is the kind, uh, is this the kinetic term? How exactly is this the potential term? You have to understand the properties of the field and see what the dependencies and uh, dependencies are and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's all about uh, Lagrangians that I had to cover so far. And uh, yeah, since we are short on time, I don't think I'll be covered to, I'll be able to cover Gates theories. Uh, I, I did have to just, you know, I, I was interested to share with you what, how exactly do we get masses uh, of electrons from the electron field and, uh, you know, um, how by studying the Lagrangian, uh, you, uh, you can, you can uh, determine how, uh, you know, by, by studying the potential term of the Lagrangian of the electron field. Uh, you can determine why do you need electrons and positrons, you know, it sort of gives you uh, a feeling about why do you have electrons and positrons? Why do you need electrons and positrons coming up in your gauge theories and so on? Uh, but if you're interested to learn about all of those, if you want to have a discussion on that, um, then we can move it to Discord. Sagar, is, are you here? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Right. So, so since we start on... Yeah, uh, just put the Discord link on uh, the Zoom chat right now. And if there's people on YouTube, then uh, for them too. And uh, I'm not sure when, but maybe soon after this talk or sometime after this talk, uh, we might discuss about gauge theories and uh, uh, how we get these mass terms, how the inverse square law for uh, gravitons and photons, uh, you know, or, or for electrons, the Coulomb's law and Newton's law of gravity, why are they inverse squared? Right, and and uh, we'll understand why are strong interactions, the strong forces, uh, small small ranged, you know, short ranged, and similarly, why are uh, weak interactions short ranged, and uh, what exactly is the Higgs field, uh, and how do you get, how do you, how does the Higgs field give masses to the other particles, and so on, um, would probably be some of the few things that we may discuss uh, on Discord either now or sometime later. Uh, if, uh, if if we, if we are discussing, then you will find me on uh, Nakshatra's virtual campus. Uh, there's a there's a voice channel called Nakshatra Cafe. I will be there. If if you find me there, then probably we are going to discuss uh, about all of this. If so, the in interested people can join in. And uh, with that, I will conclude my talk here today. Thank you very much for your patience. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I see there's questions in the chat box. So let me go through that. Okay. Um, Manish says, is it least action path? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Path of least action. That's what we're trying to find out. That's what we meant by extremizing our uh, variable, right? The A or the J. When we say we're extremizing it, we're just looking for the path of least of that J or A, which is called action in physics. Okay. Um, when we study constraints, is potential energy a kind of constraint or only other physical things are called as constraints? Okay, um, potential energy doesn't exactly act as a constraint, but it acts like a, a what do you say, a minimum most level that is possible for your uh, system, something like that. It, maybe not in a different sense, but it doesn't really exactly act as a constraint. It's, it's like a... Um, you know, if you compare it with a curry, the potential energy is like the gravy. You know, it's, it's like the base for everything that moves in it. Uh, in, in a very general sense, uh, if you didn't have any potential of any sort in the entire universe, you wouldn't exist. Because a free particle cannot exist by itself if it isn't affected by a potential. Okay, the example that we took was uh, a slightly different scenario, but uh, in general, uh, it's not possible. If there is no potential at all, if you have just a single particle, it cannot exist. So uh, the, what, we con uh, what we classify as constraints are things that uh, limit the degrees of freedom, how much your system can move around. In three dimensions, 
you have two degrees of freedom if you're if you're considering in classical mechanics you know if you have a spherical pendulum it can it has a fixed length right the length of the pendulum is fixed but it can still move in two directions it can move uh, along the direction of phi the angle phi or the angle theta defined from the uh, defined from the x and the z axis or however you want to uh, call them that. but if you have a pendulum in two dimensions it has only one degree of freedom which is the angle theta with which it it rotates because the length is fixed and and so on right? those are things that we would call as constraint they need not always be physical but yeah those are the best examples i can give you right now Okay, Kishan. I would like to give this answer also. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, suppose a ball is there on the table. Then uh, we allow the ball to move only in the table. So, what is the constant that we add to the ball? The constant that we add to the ball is that the ball cannot move away from the table, or it cannot fall from the table. so if there is a potential acting on the ball it will only uh, describe by the position of the ball on the table not the position of the ball in other table again simultaneously if the uh, constant act on the ball then the then the ball velocity moving only on the ball uh, moving only on the table describe this for kinetic energy this is how lagrangian is associated with constant i think this is the uh, answer that i have given ah that that's a, that's a pretty good answer that's a very convincing answer thank you uh, i'm sorry i didn't see you that was it i think that was satyam mm, yeah. yeah yeah good good answer satyam thank you very much all right uh, let's move on how to know whether the extremized path is the shortest or the longest path hmm mm. so so when you go through the entire process of deriving those euler lagrange equations uh you know it's it's the it's a concept that you carry forward from your lower level differential calculus you know if you're trying to find the extremum of a point you differentiate it and then you double differentiate it and then you see when the double derivative the d squared y by dx squared if it's positive or negative and then with that you sort of decide uh, if it's maximum or minimum now in in this case here uh, when we say extremize because it's a mathematical term but uh, when you sort sort of bring it over to physics we we sort of imply its minimum most right that's why we call it the path of least action because we we are trying to find uh, uh we're trying to find paths or or systems where that that thing is minimized as much as possible right uh, the the term extremized is a more of a mathematical thing you know that but even there you are trying to minimize whatever it is you're trying to minimize the the example that i showed you we were trying to uh, find the shortest distance so there the shortest thing is there but there is another problem called the brachistro kron problem you might have heard of it before uh, that problem deals with finding the path of least time the shortest time right so so it depends on what exactly is it you're studying but as far as i know uh, everything every field that you study wherever you apply uh, calculus of variation like the lagrangian systems and so on uh I, i think you do minimize your system you know you whatever you're finding for you want it to be minimized the lowest possible thing so in a sense we are looking for the shortest of that path or time or anything okay um so that's also has given an answer no need to know that we're only concerned with stationary solutions mm, yeah in a sense yes sagar told me about the hamiltonian thank you very much sagar um can we use hamiltonian for quantum mechanics also but uh i i didn't get that question aryan do you mind uh, unmuting yourself and repeating your question aryan are you here is aryan here i don't know yes okay um so as far as i understand of the question you know uh the hamiltonian that you define in uh, classical mechanics is the same uh, in quantum mechanics as well but the way you define it sort of changes right so let me write it on the board here i would like to give this answer also if you don't mind yeah sure go ahead i'd be more than happy if you go ahead go on go on actually uh, hamiltonian in classical mechanics is a physical quantity that describes the total energy of a system 
but uh, in case of quantum mechanics whenever we describe a physical quantity we used to call it an operator in other words you can say that uh, for a, a physical quantity is represented by a operator in quantum mechanics so the hamiltonian of the classical mechanics will acts as a uh, operator in quantum mechanics when it acts on a as an op- operator it will act on a wave function so when it acts on a wave function it will give energy eigen value and the respect with respect to the wave function i think this is the best answer i can give now and that is the correct answer in a sense right um so in classical mechanics hamiltonian refers i mean it corresponds to the total energy of the system which we know is a conserved quantity in quantum mechanics this is converted to an observable or we call it an observable and it still corresponds to the total energy of the system but the way you find the hamiltonian changes okay uh, like like uh, satyam just said it I, it's an op- it becomes an operator and when it, when you say it becomes an operator it implies that you can represent it as a matrix and so on and so forth right but you know that's that's like a different field study but if you can see my board uh, it has to act on a wave function like i'm writing here right every quantity that you have becomes an operator the put, there is a potential operator you know it's, it's just equal to the thing so it doesn't really make a difference but you know it's just for the sake of continuity it acts on a wave function so in a sense the the thing that you're trying to study the total energy of the system that the hamiltonian is meant for that quantity is satisfied you still get the total energy of the system the only thing that changes from classical to quantum mechanics is the way you measure it right in classical mechanics you just have to measure the momentum and the potential it is in and you get that but in quantum mechanics it becomes an operator so you have to make it operate on a state vector uh, a vector that defines the state of the system and with that you get the so called observable called the hamiltonian which corresponds to the total energy of the system and so on i i hope that answers your question aryan if you have oh if i have one question all right uh, yes yeah. yeah why why we need a uh, lagrangian in high, uh, like in that kind of question but uh, regarding our uh, newtonian things uh, why why we don't need a uh, lagrangian at that oh time? you use lagrangian in newtonian things as well it's uh, it's just that you know at lower levels you're not introduced to it because it involves partial derivatives differential equations and so on but uh, the more you read uh, about classical mechanics it's based off lagrangians uh in fact the very first chapter you pick from the book on, book by goldstein on classical mechanics deals uh, tells you about lagrangian and every subsequent chapter deals with the lagrangian so uh, no we use lagrangian in newtonian mechanics as well so the thing is uh you know we had newtonian mechanics working out pretty well but it wasn't generalized to a great level so that was done by lagrangian uh, mechanics right by the lagrangian formalism it was in a sense more generalized but that's again a huge topic in itself uh but you know lagrangian mechanics in general is is you know it's like a super set for newtonian mechanics you can do everything you can do in newtonian mechanics and more right newtonian mechanics couldn't be applied to quantum mechanics but lagrangians can be applied to quantum mechanics to study quantum mechanical systems that's why you have lagrangians for quantum field theory that's why you have lagrangians for quantum electrodynamics and so on Right, but you don't have Newton's law for uh, uh, for for quantum electrodynamics or something, right? Because you can't apply that there. The Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian mechanics, the, these formalisms of classical mechanics, and then so on, uh, uh, went on to uh, quantum mechanics, right? Uh, they they sort of generalize the whole thing, right? So that's that's okay. the thing. But it can be applied to a relativistic case. Yes yes of course of course there is in fact uh, something called the einstein hilbert action you know we've defined what action is it's the integral of a lagrangian there is an einstein hilbert action which is the basis for general relativity so if you had to um, look for general the lagrangian for general relativity in in, in a sense you get einstein hilbert action right uh, and okay. and that corresponds to a general relativity uh, general relativities lagrangian and so on Okay, means Lagrangian is a general of uh, general way of understanding the equation exactly. of motion. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Newton. Yes. Newtonian is a part of this. Okay. 
exactly yeah it's like a subset kind of a thing so okay. so lagrangian is newton newtonian plus extra stuff it it gives you more uh, uh, more opportunities to work with different kinds of things newtonian stuff you're just stuck with a, a, a you know a set of problems but lagrangian deal uh, helps you deal with those problems and others which newtonian is difficult to solve in okay okay yeah thanks um aryan i Yeah, I hope I'm audible. I just got a call. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping Aryan doesn't have any more questions. Um, ah, Dinesh. Yes, I actually wanted to cover that today, but due to the time constraint, I could not. Um, so do join the Discord discussion, which we may have in a while, or maybe tomorrow. I I can't guarantee you that. Uh, but yeah, we we will talk about it soon. I do understand you're quite excited. In fact, I had made notes on that exact point today. but yeah it's the time constraint now if you want to know about the gauss theory then i will uh, let me tell a words uh, the gauss theory actually tells uh, that uh, under certain transformation of the potential field the equation remain invariant according to classical mechanics but in quantum mechanics it uh, uh represents something different so gauss theory and standard model if you consider then this gauss theory is not classical gauss theory it's maybe the quantum mechanical approach where heisenberg picture are used to describe the equation of motion of the hamiltonian and under the gauss transformation if the equation remain invariant then it is uh, it satisfy the gauss equation a uh, gauss transformation if the equation doesn't remain invariant then it won't gonna satisfy the gauss uh, transformation as much far i remember this is the uh, relation mean for this uh, you want if you wanted to study classic Yeah, Sachin. That's exactly what we discussed yesterday about what exactly is the gauge theory and uh, what gauge transformations are and so on. Uh, thank you for your answer. All right. So, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, oh. I think we can conclude yeah, yeah. this session. Yeah, we can. Uh, I have one yeah. last question. Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, can you explain the uh, means the initial after the Big Bang theory? Uh, they said that uh, uh, due to Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, there is one point, one singularity point is happening. Oh, uh, means yeah. So, uh, can you explain how this is means how we apply Heisenberg uncertainty principle to understand this? Ah. i am not so sure if you do apply that but you know i haven't read about this so i'm not sure i can tell you anything about this i'm afraid okay uh okay. Okay. yeah actually we can't we can't understand yeah, this uh people of uh, theory one group please join the discord ah, astrophysics yes. server channel now right um also adesh i think you can stop the youtube live stream um uh, we're done with today's session so